okay, everyone in the audience should be notified that this meeting is now being recorded. Okay. <laughs> oh, does that serve? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, hi, everyone. Uh, this meeting will now come to order. This is the African Heritage Reparation Assembly meeting for Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Um, we have our normal business of the evening. So, let me read our statements and do our roll call to check everyone's. Yep. I just need a time that you're starting. Oh, I'm sorry. It is 6 18 p.m. So uh, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. See instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effect Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. Um, now I need to do a roll call of those who are present. Um, just, this, just to make sure that I can see and hear you. Uh, Irv Rhodes. I'm here, present. Awesome, I can see and hear you. Dr. Shabazz. Shabazz, present. Excellent, I can see and hear you. Michelle Miller. Miller present. Excellent. I can see and hear you. <laughs> um, so uh, we another thing we often do here is uh, approval of the minutes. Um, we were a couple minutes behind. <laughs> um, minutes being the, the documentation of the meeting, not the time. Um, given the packed agenda that we have today, uh, we were I was going to propose that we table approval of the minutes one more week and we will do all three uh, October 8th, October 13th and October 20th at the same time. So I motion that we table those. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Um, we can vote <laughs> or I guess if this, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> so Irv, how do you vote on tabling the minutes? Approval of the uh, minutes rather? All right. Thank you. Dr. Shabazz? Yes, I will go with it. I don't think it's a violation of any, any of the laws or norms. Michelle? Aye. And uh, me, I. So that is a unanimous to table the minutes. All right. Um, and maybe we'll just quickly say that our agenda is going to go a little bit out of order this evening to accommodate Halla coming in at 7.30 and um, just to have a better flow of conversation. So um, we can, do, would you like me to quickly review the order that we're taking it in or should we just go ahead and move forward and and anyone have a preference on that? Okay. So yeah, then we can move to public comment. <clears throat> During the public comment period, one of the co-chairs will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the, at the discretion of the co-chairs based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The AHRA will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. So if you would like to speak, um, please raise your hand. And I believe we have one person um, who would like to speak. And Jen, can I just... On it. Okay, great. Hi. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Hi. Um, good evening. My name is Evan Naismith. My pronouns are he, his. I live at 211 Wildflower Drive in Amherst. Um, I'm a member of the Democratic Town Committee of Amherst, an intern for Congressman McGovern, and a member of the Amherst Educational Foundation. Uh, despite these obligations, I think the most exciting thing in Amherst right now is the reparations movement. At night, when my kids sit down for TV time, I sit down for reparations research time. I have a proposal that is challenging, but it's an extremely exciting alternative to the Evanston model. Uh, I hope you'll keep an open mind. I'm proposing Martin Luther King style reparations for Amherst. Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, reparations payments should benefit the disadvantaged of all races, italicizing the word all. Majority black direct payments are the best strategy 
for closing the $900 million black white wealth gap in Amherst. It would be more popular than any alternative. It would multiply fundraising abilities. It uniquely allows for 100% constitutional direct payments, the majority of which would go to the black community. Best of all, it would provide a resilient anti-racist model for other municipalities to copy and paste. Any Amherst resident could submit an application. Race would only be used as a secondary factor as required by federal law. The reviewing board would be disproportionately black, but if a Mexican American could persuade the board of past discrimination, she would be eligible for compensation. The direct transfers to the black community would be more impactful than any of the proposed alternatives. A $2 million multicultural center would be a one-time transaction. Direct payments, on the other hand, would almost certainly be renewed, setting Amherst up for a new legacy of economic justice. Multiracial repar reparations multiplies the strength of our coalition. Universal programs are popular programs. Progressive policies actually lose support when coupled with a racial narrative. There are going to be close votes. The MLK reparations model is more likely to earn the votes of Mexican-American council members in Colorado Springs, for example. The best predictor of social program success is the diversity of its beneficiaries. And I have citations for all this. Broader adoption will lead to a more aggressive narrowing of the black white wealth gap. This is not a compromise, rather it threads the constitutional needle so as to avoid compromise. This proposal passes the John Lewis test. It is media savvy and immediate. It is within the criteria of ta Coates by asking us to acknowledge the whole of Amherst's past, not just parts. The coalition makes the movement more attractive to philanthropy and big business. Ibram X. Kendi would approve of the anti-racist results-based policymaking. Bottom line, it transfers more money directly to the black community than any of the alternatives. Here's what my real angle is. I'm confident Evanston will be overturned very publicly. What then? If there's no alternative format, that'll be a dagger to the reparations movement. However, if Amherst can provide the roadmap forward for economic justice, Evanston's overturn could act as an accelerant, spreading the movement around the country, but only if we act. I urge you to change course today on this issue by pursuing black majority direct payment reparations for Amherst and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Evan, thank you. Okay, it doesn't look like at this time we have any other hands raised, so I think we can move on. I'll note that we have a second public comment period at toward the end of the meeting. So uh, we are moving first to the adoption of ropes and work process. And um, the purpose of doing this is if we adopt one or both of these items, then we'll be able to use them and bring them up at the beginning of every meeting as a way of really um, solidifying, you know, in the, in, in, with respect to ropes, that sort of our guidelines, if we adopt those today, we would bring them up at the beginning of every meeting, we can refer to them as needed. And the same thing for Dr. Jemison's work process. Um, if we adopt that officially, then we'll be able to bring that up and refer to it um, more officially. So could we, Jennifer, do I have access to bring up the ropes document here or is it easy for you to bring the ropes document up? Either one is fine. I have the whole packet available or you can share your screen. Okay. Um, whichever you prefer. If you wouldn't mind, that would be great. If you could bring that up, that would be excellent. Can you see the agenda? Yes. yes. Perfect. Great. Um, and I, I'm, rec I'm realizing now that we don't actually have a motion or I don't have a motion written out, um, but I do believe that we need to um, make a motion to adopt the ropes to know to be used um, for the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. So um, 
there's my motion. <laughs> and do we have a second on that? Oh, can you repeat that? I'm so sorry. I need to um, like, sure, do that absolutely. word for word. Um, I move to adopt the ropes to know for use of the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. Second, Jemison. And do we have any discussion on that? Um, yeah, well. Uh, Go yes. ahead, Herb, please, yeah. Um, I have no objection to this, but I think the motion should read uh, what this actually is. We're talking about ropes. No one knows what that is except for us. Um, so uh, it, it, this has a name of it. It is a particular um, mechanism for conducting a meeting in terms of behaviors or whatever. But something needs to be there other than saying we adopt ropes because saying just saying that um, doesn't make sense. Fair enough. <laughs> Do you have some wording that you'd uh, want to add to that? Um, I, I think that the number of meetings I've had today, I'm out of words almost. So anyway, um, <laughs> if someone else be would okay. like to take a stab at it. Is this um, not meeting etiquette? Yeah. Yes. I like that. I like that. Thank you, Jennifer. Can, any other discussion on that? Great. So, um, Irv, your hand's still up, but I assume that's um, from the last time. So then let's go ahead and vote on that. So Dr. Jemison? Uh, Jemison, aye. Dr. Shabazz? Shabazz, aye. Irv? Aye. And Miller, aye. Excellent. So now moving on to the work process, uh, which may or may not be in this packet. Um, it is, it's a couple pages, Dan. Okay, great. <clears throat> so we, um, I, I actually, Dr. Jemison, would you, do you wanna make the motion for that? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, just so we've got whatever he's looking for. So um, I move that we adopt this uh, sort of prioritization or to sort of, you know, I move that we uh, adopt this itemized um, work process review um, as a way to track our progress uh, during the a AHRA meetings. I second that. And Irv? Um, I guess um, I can't remember what it was, and I can't find it in my packet. So um, I have no objections, I, but I would like to see it just to know what I'm voting on. It's what's on the screen at the moment. I don't know if you have, uh, if you're. I, all I, uh, I don't have it on the screen. I see a lot of. So this was the work process that Dr. Jemison introduced, I think the second meeting. What is and the first item on there? So I'll make sure I'm- Securing funding from 23 budget and beyond. Ah, all right. So you're calling this a work process. Right, that's what we referred to it um, as in the, you know, the, when it was introduced in the second meeting. So, that's what we're calling it, yes. So does this mean that we would be committing to this process? And if so, um, are we committing to going through this when anytime we're in the process, uh, we're gonna be going through this uh, according to the numerical values placed on it? So the motion, um, as I stated, it was as an itemization of, of work pro process items. Um, I believe, I don't know, <laughs> Jennifer, do you have that? Um, which one, which one what is was, that, I'm sorry. What was my, uh, do you have my verbatim on the motion? Oh, 
I move that we move to adopt this itemized work process review as a way to track our progress during the AHRA meetings. Thank you. So the idea is that this is just, we have these items, we can go through them and see which ones we've done. And then we can declare, oh, those are done, that's great, or there's more work to be done. Um, I am not attached to these numbers. I made an itemized list because I make things in outlines. That's just the way that I do. I am not, I do not believe that this is ordinal. And one way to look at it as, is as a guideline for us. So it's, I don't think that anything is set in stone in particular order or um, it's more to be used as a guideline. And Dr. Shabazz? Well, that's important to hear in that <clears throat> I'm wondering how restrictive or limiting this might be. From the time it was introduced, <clears throat> I raised a couple of concerns that I had with it. First of all, the second item about direct payments. Right now, in my mind, that's not the legal review. And I feel it's unfortunate that that's how, um, the before we were even impaneled as an assembly, that the KP law was asked to, to uh, form an opinion, that it was forming an opinion around the question of direct payments to individuals. In my mind, that's not even what our reparations reparative justice plan should be envisioning. So if we're, if this is a guideline, um, then to, to me right now, it's, it's problematic. It's a bit, it's a bit overly restrictive in ways. Also, number four on the eligibility question, I think I raised as well on the first night this was introduced that I'm not sure that that's really an issue for us to, to be grappling with, again, depending on how we're defining a reparative justice plan. Uh, eligibility is relevant if you're talking about individual direct cash payments, uh, individual people getting money from the town of Amherst. That's not right now what's in my head. So eligibility then is not even necessarily a major a major issue if um, if if we you know uh, think outside those those parameters. Irv, I. Uh... Milka, I agree with everything you said. Okay, well, um, I am not sure if once we make a motion, um, Dr. Jemison, if we can withdraw a motion and sort of table this for further discussion at another point. Um, do you have a strong feeling Hello, Yvonne. Nice to see you. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, I'm sorry I'm late. I was coming from an in-person appointment and just it took longer than I thought. So I apologize for being late. Um, I did not get a chance to get sworn in, so I know that I can't vote on anything. Um, but I just want to know if I can share my opinions, even though I can't vote on things. <laughs> Um, well, I did check with our, well, first of all, welcome. We're very happy to have you here. Um, and uh, we'd love to take a moment to have you introduce yourself if you feel comfortable doing that now. Um, I did check in about the deliberation piece and it's my understanding that given you're not sworn in yet, unfortunately, we can't have you participate in the deliberation for this meeting, um, but we can have you stay as a panelist and um, and then of course, hopefully you'll be sworn in by the time of the <laughs> meeting. Um, so that's, that's how I understand it right now. And I'm so sorry that that's the way that it, it works for this evening, because um, we're very excited to have you here. Um, and if you'd like to take a moment to introduce yourself, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm Yvonne Mendez. Um, I've actually lived in Amherst. Uh, gosh, I moved here in 1980 to go. You're back on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. I've been talking all that time and I'm mute. Um, I, I have, I, my name is Yvonne Mendez. I've lived here, I moved here in 1980 to come to school. So I've lived in Amherst since that time. I were, worked at the University of Massachusetts for the UMass Fine Arts Center for many years. I just retired in um, December 
I worked there 32 years. So I've been here and been in, you know, in the town for a while. I served six years as the chair of the Amherst Cultural Council. That was a few years back. Um, I've served on a couple of little smaller panels and I've worked with a lot of nonprofits around arts and education. I've done um, arts presenting and um, event planning, I'm doing some independent curating right now that's mostly focused on uh, music um, and jazz music in particular uh, and forums around um, jazz music and people of color in the mu and their um, music industry. Um, I guess that I've grown three kids in this town and they've all gone to Amherst High School and now they're living in different places in one is still in Massachusetts. All right. Okay. Oh, welcome. Hi, thanks. I'm sorry. I, I just haven't had the time to get sworn in. I'm just running and I'm out of going out of town on Friday. So I'm trying to oh, see if I can figure out getting it done tomorrow. So you, you can't do it online, you know. I have to do it. I can do it online. Yes, oh. I did it online. Okay, and I'll talk to be, Jen. It should be in a packet of material that the town manager supplied you. Okay, that sounds great. I'll try that. But yeah, thank that, you for your welcome. So I can't make comments. I can just observe is what you're saying, Michelle. Yes, that's my understanding. Great. Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, where were we? Um, so yes, do we want to consider withdrawing the motion for the work process and moving on? Um, Jennifer? You guys are, would be at a tie if, well, I don't know, Irv, did you approve or, or not? No, I agree? definitely did not approve. Okay, so then, you know, that puts you more at a tie and then there's not much that can really, you can just, table it, I th believe, at that point. Okay, great. Does that work for you, Dr. Jemison, as well? It certainly does. I'd like to say that I invite the people who have uh, edits to make them. You have the document. Please feel free to go right in and make the changes that you'd like to see in there. And then perhaps we can reconsider it when it meets your criteria. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Jemison, for October meeting, um, Jen. All right, um, I will go ahead and let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Oh, in a way where you can see the right thing. Oh. All right, sorry, Jennifer, can I ask you to share one more thing just because my screen sharing is gonna be a little bit wonky right now. Um, with all the windows I've got open. Can you share the proposal for the contents of the October report? Sure. Can you see? I can see. Thank you. Perfect. So, we have a report. So first of all, I should say that uh, the, most of the contents of this were uh, derived from instructions that I got directly from our uh, one of our um, uh, members of the town council who uh, who so you know who was engaged with us. And so um, we have been asked to provide a written report. Uh, the brief for that is what the AHRA has done so far and what our next steps will be. Um, the report can be submitted anytime before or by Wednesday noon on November 3rd, 2021 to be submitted to the town council president um, with a CC to the clerk of the town council. Um, format is supposed to be PDF. Those were the instructions. Also directly instructed that it must contain the assembly title and report name, um, the report date, the assembly membership, and our official charge with the wording from the town website. It was suggested that we could provide a list of meeting dates and links if the, if the YouTubes are already edited. Um, so then the following bit are the high level items that I thought should be included. Um, one, 
since we talked about it, it was a big topic last week, the idea of creating a sustainable fund for uh, reparations into the future, um, proposing the town, the buckets of money from which we'd like to fill that fund. Um, and also this idea about uh, using sort of a, a, having perhaps a CPAC style um, uh, way to service this activity in the future, which is something we will discuss more today. Um, including also ideas for long-term management of the fund uh, and whether or not there will be a successor body to the AHRA that's doing that. It's another topic that came up. Um, any insights and possible paths forward we've, we are getting from our legal discu discussions and then our next steps to use all this information to, to come to a final product. Uh, we were also recommended to include any articles or resources for the town council's, council's awareness that we would like them to have. This direct quote is from the instructions, it does not have to be a long report, a page or two is completely adequate. I should also add that we are also invited to appear and speak at the town council meeting, I believe, is it November 8th, 9th? Uh, whatever that Monday is, let me just- Okay, the 8th, I think. Yes, November, um, yep. <laughs> so, you know, when you think about what might go into the report, it's also possible for us to put information in there and then elaborate on it in, in person. So my first question would be, is there anything missing that feels like a priority that's not in, that's not already listed in here? From my perspective, it looks very thorough um, and like you've covered all of the bases here. And I like that it does not have to be a long report quote <laughs> that you've added <laughs> at the end. So we, we probably shouldn't include that in the report, but <laughs> um, I realize people are still processing, so I'll give folks a couple more seconds. Obviously, we were happy to add things. I intentionally kept uh, the detail low. Dr. Shabazz. Yes. <clears throat> so I think this, this is uh, uh, definitely in the right direction. Um, the uh, one item I'm not sure for, and, and also I, I'm trusting that the, the time thing, as you've mentioned, is all uh, fine that the end of October was kind of a ballpark deadline, but if, uh, if this deadline uh, works relative to town council, then, then that's, that's good to go with. The item in this here- This is the deadline I was given by the town council. So that, that's what I'm saying. So then that's, that's good to go. Um, the, uh, and of course this order may not necessarily be the, the final order for the report, but the one that I am um, uh, ideas for long-term management of the fund successor body to the AHRA. I think if we are able to figure that out by uh, before November 3rd, then we probably can go out of business well before, well before June, uh, our, our final deadline in June. I think that's one that we probably don't have enough research time and, and, and deliberation time to really be able to report out much on. So I would not um, uh, straddle us with that. It's not a time sensitive area. It's not something that we, we and, and, and I just don't know by November 3rd, how much we'd actually be able to fill out that bullet point. So why, why put it on ourselves at this point would be my, my, my comment. Uh, so just a quick response to that. Um, there, there is at least one idea about this that will be brought up tonight. So we have one idea and it is in fact only an idea, a call for ideas there. Um, so that would be the one reason that I would, I would want there in there because it does show an example of us thinking about the future and the fact that this will have to be managed. Irv? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it should be in there because uh, we, we can always say, hey, here's what we're working on now, but this is our intention. We need to sig signal our intention with this report also. Mm -hmm. 
agree with that. And I like that wording or signaling our intention. Thank you. So um, I do also appreciate Dr. Shabazz, what you said about not necessarily being held to the order. Um, again, this is just an idea, larger, broader idea of content. And so that's why I'm giving you know, just a few more seconds in case anybody goes, oh my goodness, there's a major topic that's missing. Um, that's my, my, the thing that I most wanna, wanna grab at here. Um, if there's something that we really need to tell the town council that we haven't committed to communicating here. One thing we may consider adding is any ideas we have about community engagement, um, since that is a piece that tends to come up quite a bit. We may not have solidified those ideas yet, but we may um, want to include just a small couple sentences about, about that. I can't add it in real time, but could certainly add that uh, if needed. And I have a question, um, just as a participant, uh, is this report designed as a progress report? You know what I mean? It's not a, it's not a, is it not designed? It's not designed as a, we've done these things. Well, yeah, a, 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 like a preliminary progress report to help us move forward through the rest of the process, right? So the, yeah, so the language I was given is, you know, what the AHRA has done so far and next steps. Okay. So I think we get to interpret that, but yeah. And Irv, is your hand up again or is that kind of nice? uh, Definitely not. All right. <laughs> um, in that case, um, so I, Oh, no, we've got to do that. Yes, Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, so I'm, I'm close to being able to move uh, for acceptance of this proposal. I'm wondering what, if, if uh, you could speak to next steps, what that, um, what you envision in that, under that bullet. Um, yes, well, I, <laughs> I don't want to be problematic, but I was thinking next steps. Uh, you know, we are going to come, we're, we're going to have a meeting next week, right? We will have two more meetings before, and we'll have one more meeting before we have to submit this, right? So I believe next steps will be broad, right? When we give the details of the monies that we're trying to come up with, and we give the details of what a CPAC proposal might uh, might look like that involves some steps to take towards having legislation. So we would have to describe that as a next step, perhaps not in excruciating detail, but just like next step, we have to make sure that we can apply for this legislation. Um, if we are thinking that we are going to have some other long-term management of it, but we haven't decided, we only have to, we only have ideas, then we have to indicate that we are how we were planning to decide what that long-term management might look like. And I do think that by June, the goal is for us to actually know what reparations are going to look like for this town. I might be wrong about that brief, but I think that's where we're headed. So since that is not in the content here, I think that's going to be one of our primary next steps is that we're going to be identifying the actual shape of reparations. Once again, that'll be something like what actually gets written about in the report is also something people will get to review. This is just meant to be um, a broad, a broad indication. This is meant to make sure we're not missing anything, truly. And Dr. Jemison, could you take us through the process of getting it from this to getting a finished report in the next two weeks? Uh, sure, I'm making this up on the fly. Um, uh, <laughs> people are probably going to have to give someone some words. Um, I will volunteer as tribute to be the person you give the words to, but I will probably ask people to uh, write down certainly any of the homework that they've done around funding. Um, and then I will, I will make words and format happen and folks can review that in next week's meeting. So that means there'll probably be a pretty tight deadline on getting you some words. And I think we'll use some portion we talked about next week to workshop this so that we're all together working on it. So the goal would be between now and next week to, as Dr. Jemison said, get her some words based on 
the particular things that we've been working on, and then we can shape it more together uh, next week at our meeting in sort of a workshop style. It gets really tricky with the open meeting law to get these things done. So I think that's a good, a good strategy. <clears throat> Dr. Boss? I move that we accept uh, this uh, proposal for the contents of the October written report as amended and with possibilities for uh, additions as, as may arise. I second that. Any further discussion? Okay. Do you want to take the vote, Dr. Jemison? Sure. Uh, sure. Did, does the vote include the addition of the engagement? Uh, as amended. Paris, as amended. As amended. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank we, you. No problem. We can't edit in real time. So, <laughs> um, so uh, Michelle, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Dr. Shabazz. Aye. Uh, Mr. Rhodes. Aye. Jemison, aye. <clears throat> Great. Okay, um, so I'm just looking at the time. Uh, we really would like to have Hala here for the legal discussion and the funding discussion. So we are going to move to um, the black census, which is F on our agenda. And that is um, me. Is that you? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So Black Census, um, we, we started to have a discussion about it. Uh, a, was it last week's meeting? Um, since then, Michelle and I had a chance to meet with Representative Mindy Dom, who um, asked us who was doing that census and then gave us an idea. And then I had a question about whether or not the census itself was meant to be uh, a census that is a snapshot of now or a census that was sort of historical and looking back and who's lived here forever. Are we looking for descendants and things like that? So right. since I don't know the history of how the black census developed, I'd like to ask that, that second question first. What is the intention of the census as it was um, being sort of developed and, and thought about with, uh, with, with BAM? Herb, do you want to speak first? You're muted. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. So the idea um, behind a, uh, the Black Census is as a um, uh, is not historical. It is based on uh, first of all the as a data point the 2020 census that tells us that a little over 2,000 uh, residents of Amherst, as recorded uh, by census takers. Um, identified in 2020 as Black African American. The question comes, can we find a way to construct a mailing list, email, ground mail, cell phone, whatever contact means possible to as many of, the, uh, of, of that population, particularly of the 18 years old and up, uh, members of that group identifying as uh, Black African American um, uh, of African heritage, as, as our assembly here is called, um, can we identify as many of that group possible to then be able to, uh, one, keep them abreast of the, the work that the town is doing in constructing a municipal repar reparative justice plan and to solicit their input, the input of uh, as many of that um, uh, 1,000 plus uh, 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 members, residents of our Amherst community 
living here now that uh, identify so to uh, solicit from them their ideas about what would uh, what um, meaningful reparative justice efforts could look like, would look like, and then and there uh, or and or at another point to be able to uh, look at proposals uh, that are coming forward and to give feedback. So just as a means to reach out to the, the community that um, uh, lives here now, that defines themselves as of uh, a black African-American of African heritage and have um, a, um, and, and, and therefore uh, has some relationship to the experiences of anti-black racism of, uh, uh, of, of, of Jim Crow, of, of uh, end of slavery, uh, and of the, the whole systemic harms that have gone on um, uh, uh, in this town from, uh, uh, from its origins in 1760 to the present. So that is, uh, that is the, the, the harmed community, that is the injured community that we would like to be in, be able to be in contact with in the shaping of a reparative justice plan or down the line in getting feedback about um, what are areas of harm that, that uh, are, are most urgent to address, that, that that group itself deems important to address. And just further, I would add that right now in our efforts, um, as I put out the call to various um, elected, black elected officials and, and our, our former black elected officials, and then we began to convene work on this in the form of what has become known as the Black uh, Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts. One of the things that we, um, uh, we have begun to, to develop that list by our own networks and informal outreach and it has grown to close to 200. But uh, again, there's uh, argue, arguably another eight to, to 900 or more um, residents out there that we have yet to identify and yet to, to, have, uh, to be in communication with. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rich, did you have anything to add or? Yes. Yeah, it's really, you know, it's really important that this be done. I mean, there are all kinds of people in town and Amherst uh, who claim to be speaking for the black population. Uh, however, we, we can only um, guess at who they're talking about uh, because we really don't know. Uh, we, we have no way of communicating with that particular population uh, for any kind of specific input. And if ever there was a time to have this kind of input, it's now. So we really need to get serious about this and figure out ways of going about doing it and funding those ways to do it. The funding is there. We just haven't developed a specific me mechanism that we wish to um, employ to be able to do this. And we need to do that. Okay, By the way, one more thing. Uh, yep. one, one more thing. Uh, there's some confusion in terms of how people should address me. I would like for you to address me either as Dr. Rhodes or Irv, but please no mister. Yes, I'm sorry about my mistake before, Dr. Rhodes. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, I did not mean to raise my hand there. Um, so I, based on what I heard, you already have the information just in terms of understanding what number to expect from the 2020 census. And what you actually need are like some sort of contact. You need to know who these people are and how to get in contact with them. Um, so, okay. So not strictly a census, but more a, a contact. Okay. So one of the things that uh, Rep Dom did suggest was that um, 
if we spoke to the appropriate people in town, uh, you might be able to leverage uh, sort of the machinery that's already in place to do uh, sort of uh, the block by block census um, that occurs uh, usually to confirm residency, to fill up voter rolls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was one suggestion. Um, so I offer that to, uh, to you too as a way to look into that and to see if that can work. Um, it might be, uh, you know, if you, if you, I don't know if you need a new count of, of who the people are, but just in terms of getting to them, you know, I don't know if it would be possible to add a question or, um, you know, uh, if there, have there be something else in that mailing when, when it happens, but that might be machinery that you can leverage. Go ahead, Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. And yes, and if you can re recall at one of the meetings that town manager uh, Mokelman attended, um, you know, I, I, I read him loud and clear to please wait until after the November 2nd election. So uh, I think there is machinery here. I think there is the will within the uh, town governance to, to open the books, to help us to, uh, uh, to move from voter rolls and any other kinds of uh, property listings and so on to, uh, to begin to go through that and look at it. But just in, in, in light of the, you know, all of the intense work going on right now, getting ready for a townwide vote, it, it just seemed as though this is something we needed to, to kind of park for right now and then look at, look at it after uh, uh, November 2nd. Um, the other thing is there are other opportunities and that people have talked to us about is, for example, taking an ad in a um, in the newspaper in the, in some of the local uh, media outlets, uh, giving an address, asking folks if they so identify to please, you know, um, send in the, the requested information of uh, name, address, uh, ground address, email address, uh, phone, uh, uh, phone number. Um, to, to send it in to a, a, uh, an address or, or email address that, that we, would, we would provide. Uh, also putting such a request out on the World Wide Web. And um, just as a quick update at this moment, we were scheduled to have that discussion. I had a, uh, um, uh, a problem uh, getting to that meeting, but we've rescheduled for tomorrow. So we will be looking at what are the possibilities for AHRA working through the town to create a website, for example, that could um, present these questions and, and give folks an email or something to send their information in voluntarily. It's the same thing. And for me, the term census is good in that every 10 years, federal government sends folks out, pays folks actually to go knock door to door to go through all the residents of, a, of, of every place on the, the country and to record, to list the address where they're at, take the names of all the people that are there, ages, racial identification, all of that. They do that. The only thing right now with the 2020 data is that fine grain uh, information at the census track level is not available. Uh, someone was just reminding me in a meeting that uh, actually what's just become available the last year that has become available is 1940. Mm. So right now we can get granular data, census track data, street by street, block by block, number by number of every black person, but it would be for 1940. It wouldn't be for 2020. 2020 won't be available for another 60 years. It's there. It's in Washington, D.C. or wherever they store this stuff, but it's not available to the public. So we have to construct it by other means. We have to, if, if we, that, uh, to do this, we have to then construct it by other means. And it's still all voluntary. Even when the census takers go out from the federal government, it's voluntary. You, t you answer what you want to answer and you answer how you want to answer. So uh, uh, we're not imposing on anyone. It's just voluntary information that constructs a database that yes, we can use as Irv has, has said to communicate with, with that population about the work that we're doing. John, do you have something you need to add before you, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to touch on a, oh. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Irv. 
Yeah, one idea is that um, in terms of this is that anyone who's been in politics in Amherst and running for office uh, before the internet became really ubiquitous in Facebook, one of the things that would be done is that the post office has a service called Every Door, Every Box that you could send out a postcard uh, to everyone in Amherst and we could fund that, that can be funded. That's an excellent suggestion, as is uh, the suggestion that Dr. Shabazz made about putting ads out. I think that um, between the Indy and the Amherst Current and the Gazette and all these places that we have, um, I think that's an excellent suggestion. I also wanted to build on something that you had brought up previously, Dr. Shabazz, and it may have been in a conversation that just the two of us had about the Dunahue Institute. This is something that Rep. Dom brought forward. Um, she said that Lynn, our, our council president previously, I think worked at the Dunahue Institute. So Lynn may be a good person to talk to about how they could be helpful for us in, in moving forward with this. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is I do think it's um, maybe useful at some point to come back to this question that Dr. Jemison had about historical uh, data, um, depending on the type of reparations program that we put together and whether or not eligibility goes back, you know, <clears throat> to a certain year, um, pulling some historical data, which is going to probably be a much harder task, but equally could be equally important. So I just want to keep that in our minds as well. Yes, Jennifer. Uh, I am I up. Irv had his hand up first. I, I, I just wanted to say is in terms of the Donahue Institute, uh, myself and three other people met with their demographer over there, who is an expert in relationship uh, to the uh, population census and has a ton of information. Um, and and uh, I was just reminded that we were supposed to make, uh, get back in contact with her um, like now uh, because the, the census uh, information is now available. And this person really is a remarkable expert on the Amherst census and could uh, provide us with, with uh, some really incredible detailed information. And I will go back through my notes and find out her name and get back in touch with her. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just a, a couple of things. One, I wanted to follow up on Dr. Shabazz about the meeting that was supposed to happen today. So I just wanted to say that part of the thing is if you wanted to do some sort of reach out where, well, first it would, we could add a website from our from your web page that would link to the web page, but you could also use Engage Amherst to have folks. We could create an entire survey or however you would like to do it, a questionnaire or that is specific for this that could be put on um, Engage Amherst. But as the person who before working for the town was not connected at all. I'm still worried that there's a lot of people that will slip through those cracks. And so I'm yet again, always a fan of boots on the ground. Um, you know, there's different events that are coming up over the next few months that people that you guys should most likely represent be representative at and um, perhaps you can collect some of that data that way just because, you know, if you're not in touch with the local government, you're not looking for something like this. And if you're not necessarily involved, I mean, it's just, you know, the papers are always iffy, not everybody gets the paper. So, and if we do, you know, often my paper ends up in sneakers. So it's just not, you know, it, it's anything. So I just really suggest that you guys do some boots on the ground work with that. And I love outreach. So I'm always like excited to do it. Um, so what it does sound like is that there are lots of modes for this to be achieved through. So what I want to know is 
who is the point person who's leading on this and when is the next time we should check in with you about how this is going. Well, since I'm working on the website part, I can we can put me on the agenda for the next meeting to to update on that. I will meet with uh, with uh, the the team there at uh, uh, tomorrow, and so we'll have some. I'll have some progress to report on on that. And in terms of some of the other modalities, um, you know, Irv and I both being with the uh, uh, Black Assembly um, of Amherst, Mass, and and whatnot. That's that's part of the work that's going on there. So, um, you know, individually or together, uh, we can certainly, you know, check back in on, on, on that piece. And he's meeting with Donahue people. I had a conversation uh, a few days ago with Lynn Greismer as well. And by the way, we could well say she is the living embodiment of, of the Donahue Institute in, in Amherst. She was with it for 31 years. She was the executive director for 19 years. There is no one more Donahue Institute uh, uh, in town right now than, than, than Lynn. I mean, she's retired from it, but, but yes, yeah, she knows all the players and she was very helpful to me in our conversation. And I agree with her, that is a, that is a direction we ought to uh, follow up on. If you'll follow up with the demographer meeting uh, I'll, I'll continue to pursue uh, some of the other modalities and, and between the two of us, I think we, we ought to be able to, to report back in on progress on that. Excellent. Great, really. Yeah, good, okay. So I think we're probably ready to move on to um, the next item, which, Dr. Jemison, I think we talked about going to G, right? Yep. Would you, you sure. have a question on that one? Yeah. Yeah. So Alexis couldn't be here tonight, but she did provide an update um, about a potential screening. Um, and uh, so she said that they're actually planning to screen uh, Coffee's film live on the web, as well as through a TV broadcast. And uh, the web screening will be linked to a donation opportunity and the TV broadcast will have a message that will point people to where they can donate. Um, so Amherst Media is all ready to work this out. She just needs to have a, a last meeting uh, with Coffee's side to get some the rights worked out and some final things. So um, she's anticipating having another meeting with Coffee probably before our next meeting. So she might have some dates when she gets back, but basically all the right steps have been made in, in that direction. So um, hopefully we'll be able to have that soon as another thing that we're, uh, you know, as an event and another way to outreach with people. It's probably our shortest uh, item of the night. <laughs> all great information though. Um... Okay, so it's 715 and um, I think Hallow will not be here at least until 730. Um, so I think that given what we have left on the agenda and Dr. Jemison, let me know if this makes sense to you. Um, we had talked about potentially going to the E, which is Administration of Reparations Program, but that may not make a whole lot of sense until we've covered the other aspects of the financial piece. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we go to at least a couple of the items in this financial update piece and start reviewing that. And then when HALA comes, if we can, if it feels right to stop and sort of go to the other more vision legal uh, aspect that we talked about, we can do that. But I know I can knock a couple of these out pretty quickly. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, so if that works... Um, we can move on then. We're looking at C, funding financial updates, and we've each been assigned one or more of these items to report on. And so I will begin by talking about the Mass Cultural Council grant. Um, I saw that Rep Dom posted that they had extended their deadline up into November and um, when I looked at what they were focusing on, it is very much in the arena of racial justice, racial equity, um, and centering BIPOC um, and marginalized people. Um, and so <clears throat> one thought that I had is the possibility of 
applying for this grant to be used as funding to document our work as we talked about in a previous meeting. So um, with, I know that Hala, that was sort of her insight that she had in the first or second meeting. So without her here, maybe we can revisit that with her and also without Alexis here who would be involved in that. I just wonder if there's any interest in applying for that grant um, to be used in this way or in some other way. And I will volunteer myself to take that on to do the application if it's something that folks want to pursue. I like the idea. I'm just, have you confirmed that we're, that we're eligible, right? Like, would it actually have to be so as a like it's because we're a town like we're a town entity as opposed to like would Hala apply or would you Michelle Miller apply and then use those funds that's the only thing I wouldn't want you to go down that road uh, <laughs> not confirming that my understanding based on what I read and we would definitely want to clarify this is that an organization can apply so um, a, a, a town committee or organ nonprofit organization is eligible to do that. I will just also say that um, other town departments can apply. Like it's, it is something that can be applied for, awesome. for different things from anyone really. So I, I think this is, this is important, particularly for the re remaining months of our charge through June, opportunities to um, even do some things along the way that help to educate the public, not even just as an end of, end of project, uh, documentary. Uh, I would say as well, we have a, a, a videographer, a documentarian uh, in our midst now. Uh, in addition to uh, Alexis, uh, Yvonne has a great deal of uh, experience and, uh, and background in this kind of area as well. Um, so I think we're, we're definitely well positioned to, um, uh, to bring this narrative, to bring this story out and uh, in, a, in a good way. And so, yes, if uh, Mass Cultural Council would see the value um, in this in this piece, I think we definitely are uh, are well situated to carry it out. Great. And um, Irv, did you have any thoughts about this one way or the other? Or... Oh, you mute, muted yourself. No, I. Um... I have no thoughts, no further thoughts beyond what's already been said. Okay. So do we need to make a motion to sort of direct me to apply? Do we want me to figure out, fill out the application to the best of my capacity and then bring it to the next meeting as an agenda item for review because we will have that time. So if I can get it completed between now and then, then we can bring it for review at the next meeting. I don't know I if we need we, motion. I think or we just... can sort of agree by acclamation. Uh, I don't. I don't know. We have to have a motion on that. But um, but yeah, the the uh, um, but yes, I, I'd say carry. You know, move move it forward, and and then let's look look again as it comes up. Okay, great. And Yvonne, if I could um, get in touch with you once you're sworn in, it sounds like you might have some good ideas about this and background and experience in this. So if, if that works for you, I'd love to be in touch this week um, to talk about that. I'm sure. I, I also, I'd love to do that because I think you need to, because I was the chair for six years of that committee, mm -hmm. um, I will say that you know, I don't know if things have changed, but I think there needs to be a little uh, a more specific direction in order to um, apply mm. for the grant. Okay, great. So let's talk offline after this and we'll get straight on that and then um, take it from there. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so I could go over cannabis um, or the stabilization fund tracking unless Dr. Jemison, um, you want to move to, I was sort of thinking to save the CPA and um, the ARPA and the CDBG to see if Halle gets here in the next nine minutes. Um, what do you think? Um, I, I can CDBG 
before Hala gets here. I mean, the, the too long didn't read version, and I will give the long one, is uh, <laughs> that um, uh, these, these funds are high administrative burden, very specific, have to be applied for every year and would be best suited for like an individual project the year we know we need to do it as opposed to like, oh, this is gonna be some money we can put in our, our bucket for a sustainable fund. That's, that's just not the way they the block grants work. Um, also the block grants are required to be used for uh, majority low and moderate income uh, people, which, you know, covers some of an African heritage community in, in Amherst, Massachusetts, but not all of an African heritage community in Massachusetts, which is sort of interesting because if we were getting those funds to benefit the entire African heritage community, we might be leaving some people out based on the mandate of that, those particular funds. So, um, you know, based on my discussion with, with uh, Nate Malloy and uh, the research I did, I, it, it doesn't feel like a good fit for let's, you know, it's you know a ladle that we can scoop out and, and put into our sustainable fund, but uh, you know any given year that there's a project that fits well into that remit, it's definitely worth it. Although it is very high administrative burden. Excellent. That's really good information. Does anybody want to add to that? I know that um, Dr. Shabazz or Irv, do you have any? Anything to add or say in response to that? No. Okay. I think that covered it pretty well. It's uh, it, it would be something if we had a project to propose. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's, I guess, move to, I'll give a quick update. I um, checked in with, um, Town Manager Bockelman about the stabilization fund tracking. And I'd actually just, if I could, <laughs> if you could give me two seconds to pull up what he said, um, because I'd rather have his words than mine. Um, here we go. So he said, um, the town council has created the stabilization fund for reparations but there have been no funds put into it at this point. Only the town council can put money into the stabilization fund and it requires a vote of the town council to do that. I anticipate we will go to the town council in the next couple months with a request for an appropriation into the fund. And I believe I saw somewhere in uh, either his town in his report um, or somewhere else that monies were certified. So I believe that part of the process happened. Um, so at this point, it is just a matter of getting, uh, requesting from the town council to make the appropriation. Um, and in terms of tracking that, he will let us know when that, when those um, steps are going to be taken. So between him and Sean, we will be made aware of when those steps will be taken. And I took your point, Dr. Shabazz, um, last time about that really being a, a historical moment for us to capture. Um, so we'll make sure of that. And you have your hand up, so please. Yeah, just to say, um, uh, I wondered if that response was concerning um, requesting for 2023, 20, uh, uh, because, it, um, or for the, for the, at the end of this current fiscal year to th that it goes through that process. If, if rescue me if I'm wrong, I thought that from the free cash that resulted from the previous fiscal year, the fiscal year that has gone by, that that 200 and something has been certified. It's just a matter of when it gets actually deposited. There's no more town council vote necessary for that amount of money. It's just, an administrative action to be deposited to this particular account. I think the question of a, of a town council vote would be for uh, free cash coming out of this current fiscal year cycle that that would have to be voted again. Please rescue me if I I'm wrong. I think I'm gonna rescue you here. Um, so what the town council, uh, what the town council voted on was the creation of the stabilization fund. 
So that was step one. Um, and that has happened. So I think, and we can clarify this, that what town manager Bachelman is saying is the money that we spoke about in theory going into that, which they are going to do, um, still does need to go through the process of being voted on by the town council. But all of the goodwill for that is there. It's just a matter, a matter of going through that formality. And uh, I, it looks like um, Councillor uh, Brewer can help us further. Yeah. Let's call on Irv first before. No, no, I, I want to hear from Alyssa. Okay. Thank you, Irv. And so I sent a long email about this to Michelle and Dr. Jemison last week. And so I'm not going to try and recreate that right now. But what I will say is what Michelle just indicated is accurate that yes, the funds been created. No, no money's been put into it. I, I will tell you listening to the report of what her conversation was that in a some period of months that's going to be brought back. I have no idea why that would need to be true. It should be going to the finance committee now they yes. were going to meet about it this week that was already discussed at town council that it was that they were hoping to have had that conversation at finance committee this week but the materials weren't ready yet so they canceled that meeting but that's not months that's now that needs to happen before the new town council is seated because that's definitely part of like where we're at with all these things to get that money put in there and then there's going to be that conversation and the, the goodwill Michelle talked about in terms of that rough amount of money seems to be in everyone's mind, then there will need to be another conversation, as Dr. Shabazz indicated, about and then going forward, how will the money work? But we definitely need to get that first deposit in there, and that should be able to happen in November because it should be. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Brewer. So it's been, you know, we know that the free cash has been certified. Um, and uh, I, I, I do, it is concerning to me that uh, a couple of months, um, that a couple of months was in the conversation in relationship to the town manager. It's concerning to me. And the reason it's concerning to me is that I know that there is a mad scramble for funds. Uh, because of the upcoming budget year. And I don't want to get us in, caught up in that. So Alyssa, if you're listening, I would appreciate it if you would talk to your uh, town councilors, uh, other co town council members to get this moving uh, uh, with really uh, an expedited, because there's really no need to have a couple months. It really should be uh, done as soon as it's on the council's agenda. And that can be uh, soon. Anyway. Thank you, Irv. Uh, okay, so we've made note of all of that and um, we can add that as something that we'll continue to track as we go along. Any other questions or comments about the stabilization fund? Jennifer, did you have your hand up at some point in that? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I'm ready for, I'm ready for cannabis. All right. Discussion. Discussion. <laughs> okay. So if we could pull up the packet again, I'm going to refer us to um, a document that's in the packet and also a statement that I made um, at a finance committee meeting back in May. Um, and I may actually just go ahead and read okay so we have this guidance on equitable cannabis policies for municipalities and jennifer if you could just um scroll down to the next page i believe it is um, um uh, maybe up a little bit i'm sorry i, I guess does it I, need to be enlarged um yeah that would help <laughs> potentially i think And just if you could scroll down a little bit further here. Okay. Um, oh, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> this is longer than I remember it. 
Um, mm, uh, keep going, yep. Okay, so this is actually, um, oh. uh, <laughs> I wish I, I should have it in front of me here. Okay, so if you could just actually scroll down, Jennifer, to my statement that I made um, in May to the Finance Committee with respect to can using cannabis funding and <clears throat> right here, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I said in the statement, and I'm just going to read it quickly um, because it was it was I think more concise than me coming up with another way to present this. So I say here that there are poetic and practical reasons to use cannabis money um, for racial equity and justice. Since the 1970s, enforcement of marijuana possession laws have been carried out with staggering racial bias. According to a 2013 report published by the American Civil Liberties Union, nearly half of all drug arrests made in 2010 were for marijuana possession, for marijuana possession, were for, for marijuana possession, were for marijuana possession. Uh, um, hang, all drug arrests made in 2010. Okay, we'll just keep moving. And although marijuana use was roughly the same among black, blacks and whites, blacks were nearly four times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession. <clears throat> Practically speaking, the Cannabis Control Commission in its guidance on equitable cannabis policies for municipalities recommends the same. This is a quote from their guidance document. A municipality may adopt a tax of up to 3% on adult use cannabis retail sales by a vote of its legislative body. In in many state and local jurisdictions, Massachusetts included, a portion of the cannabis tax revenue is earmarked for restorative justice, jail diversion, workforce development, industry-specific technical assistance, and mentoring services. Equity goals may similarly be supported by designated part of the local tax or community impact fee if adopted as part of the host community agreement for similar local programs. So um, just to kind of um, focus us in on where Amherst is currently with respect to the cannabis tax is it really hasn't made any decisions whatsoever about how cannabis tax will be used. Um, and there are, a, a, there are several different reasons for that. One being um, it's sort of been in, in there's an instability in terms of what's happening. There are lots of retail locations that have opened. Um, one of our larger retail locations, for example, Rise, has recently gone back to medical only. So when we're talking about using cannabis, we're talking about only the tax revenue, not that um, community host fee, the other part that was in that. So, um, and, and that tax only comes with retail locations. So <clears throat> we have an opportunity to make a case in our recommendations for having some portion of the cannabis tax revenue being um, used specifically for reparations. And so we have to decide as a body if that's um, an avenue that we want to take. And um, as far as I can understand it, really very little discussion has happened um, at all. And there's also not been a whole lot of clarity based on my research around how much revenue has actually even been received. Um, I did a public records request way back and I did get some numbers back on that that were promising, but it was like the first year. Um, and I think things have really changed. And so um, we would want to, if we want to pursue this, uh, identify myself or somebody else to do a little bit more research into what actually would be available. And then as a body, we would want to determine how we wanted to approach um, requesting those funds and making the case for that in our recommendations. Did you say that last part again, Michelle? Um, yes, I said, so um, we would at this point want to assign somebody to 
potentially um, through a public records request or um, through, I think, I think that's how I did it last time is, and Jennifer, you can help me out here. I think I made a request to um, receive the information that was needed um, to, to indicate how much was received, but there were some like parts that were not parsed out yet that are now in the, um, in the budget, they're identified. I think it was like the hotel or, um, Jen, do you know, do you know what I'm talking about here? No. Okay. Like the, um, Anyway, it doesn't matter. The, the point is, is that somebody would need to do some additional research to see what was available um, and, and what the actual landscape is. And then as a body, we would want to determine um, if we want to make the case for cannabis funding to be part of our recommendations in our, you know, to the town council. Irv? We know how much money, uh came in last year and the year before. I mean, that's part of all the budget pre presentations that the town does. And Sean does a great job of that. He he tracks every dollar and it's and it's all all usually in the uh, the budget document. Uh, the question only has to be asked of him. Um, how much money did um, cannabis um, contribute to the budget? from cannabis sale, uh, sales, to, uh, the sales tax. That number is available. Um, that's, that's one. Two uh, is that what I do know is, you know, because of my experience of being on the budget committee and finance committee and giving the time, given the time of year, I can tell you that as of now and going forward, there is a concerted effort to look at all sources of income to uh, put into the upcoming fiscal year 23 budget. Uh, so uh, we, if we wish to have an impact on that and not have uh, a claim being put to us that that money has now already been accounted for and that not only has it been accounted for is that we have decided to use it uh, some, somewhere else. Um, so we really need to get on this. I mean, it's not something that we can set around. We don't have enough time to sit around and talk about it. If we want to have that money or all of it or a portion of it, we need to lay claim to it. Now, all that money goes into the general fund. We, they, they have, we have not, it hasn't, from my knowledge, uh, been any kind of, um, pigeonholing of this particular money, earmarking of that money. Earmark. Thing. That's right. So we, again, that money, as far as I'm concerned, is unspoken for until it's spoken for. Can we please hear right. from Councilor Brewer? I think her hand is up. Yeah, please bring her in. <laughs> she will do a much better job at explaining this right now. No, it's just that I'm <laughs> supposed to be able to offer, not necessarily offer you advice, but offer you on how, it, how, how things are actually working on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. And as Irv said, that information is in the quarterly budgets, only very recently has it been placed in the quarterly budget reports. And the money has already been used in the budget without any discussion with town council as to whether or not we wanted to earmark that money, which is a great source of frustration to me because when I was on the select board and helped write the zoning and general bylaws associated with this work, that we believed we would have a conversation about earmarking the money. But Amherst doesn't like to earmark money. That's just like not our style. You hear that from other communities and they say, oh, when we get money from X, we're gonna put it into Y. And they might do it officially and they might do it unofficially, but they, they have that theme. East Hampton talks about that with their cannabis money. We've never been able to really move that conversation forward at the select board and town council level. So I agree completely with Irv that you need, if you believe this is a reasonable source of money, then you should say you want it now and that this is what you want permanently because it has already been used up in this budget proposal. It was just 
as Irv said, it just goes in general operating. And so the first few years they didn't predict it. So it was like an unexpected receipt. It was like bonus. But then they started saying, oh, well, we have this money. Let's just start spending it. And it's not going to anything in particular. It's just going to all the things we all care about. So if you want this money, I agree with him completely that now would be the time to ask for it. The way that you should be able to do that is now, Michelle, that you're part of such an esteemed town committee. You don't have to do public records requests anymore. <laughs> and you can simply say to Paul, the, <laughs> the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, once the following information and CC the town council on it. And if you don't get it, then we'll follow up. But yes, they should be able to pull out for you the figures from the last several quarterly budget reports. So that as Irv says, the, the information's there. It's just a matter of presenting it to you and you seeing if that's the right amount of money. And if you wanna ask for all of it, or if at one point there was some discussion as to whether or not it might go into an affordable housing bucket. So um, my advice rather than just information would have to be take the money now if you possibly can before someone else starts getting used to spending it on all the other important things we do. And um, Council Brewer, can you just clarify, what was I referring to that it was sort of meshed in with at one point? Was it like the lodging tax? Well, fee? it was, yeah, it wasn't really being separated out. So back in the day, um, at one point when we were looking, because there's always these locally adopted excise things, right? So we all pay in taxes when we stay in a hotel and we pay taxes when we buy meals. And then there's a local adoption, right? And so some towns that don't have restaurants don't bother adopting a local excise tax on meals. We of course are like, ooh, let's tax everything. <laughs> so we do the local on hotels. We do the local on meals and we did the local on cannabis. If there was an alcohol tax we could do locally, trust me, we'd do that too. Um, and so then when those reports were made for a while, they were just kind of lumping all the excise taxes together because you know, in comparison to other pots of money, it's not a huge pot, but we wanted to be able to track it separately. So then we separated out lodging and meals so we could track that better. But then at one point, kind of the fees that you mentioned from the host community agreements mm -hmm. and the excise tax for marijuana kind of all got lumped together as cannabis marijuana money. And so we're just still working on parsing that out. So everyone knows they're talking about the same pot of money, pot of money <laughs> at any given moment. <laughs> so um, yeah. as you indicate, the excise tax is the money in question here, not the host community agreement money. Don't be confused by percentages that are out there, but you know, hopefully it's still in the range of $200,000 a year, hopefully more than that. Certainly other surrounding communities are seeing larger amounts than that but um, that's the rough scale that you're looking at right now, just on the excise tax. And so if we make a request, like you indicated um, to town manager Bachman with a copy to the town council, will that, what we receive back, will that be only the excise, will we be asking only for the excise amount? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. So um, with that in mind, then we, I think, are in agreement or let me see some sort of show that we were in, a, in agreement to move forward with that um, ASAP. Okay. When you say move forward, so this report we're generating, this, that for November uh, uh, 2nd or 3rd, that, that then we're saying would be something we could report out as a request. It's a really no. good question. I think you should have an answer before your reports do. This Definitely. is really pretty simple. This is an easy lift for Sean. Definitely. So we just have to identify um, somebody to write this email and request this information. And so I'm happy to do that, Irv, if you want to do it, because um, you know, you've sort of been handling a bunch of this let me know either way it doesn't matter yeah i i i, I definitely I, i'd be more than happy to uh, reach out and get that information and as a um, former uh rehabilitated uh bureaucrat i can tell you that at this particular point in time of year every bit of money that's there or that's going to be there is going to be and is already in play in terms of being soaked up and if 
I have not uh, conveyed the urgency of our actions to you, uh, to you in the past. I'm, I'm really wanting to convey the urgency that we need to get moving. Great. Okay, so that is assigned to you um, to go ahead and reach out and get that information and then you can um, Well, it will certainly be an agenda item next week, um, but you could also forward the information to Dr. Jemison and I. Um, uh, uh, and just, include uh, in just, to be, just to be clear, uh, what information do you wish for, uh, for me to gather and then provide um, to the council next uh, at our next meeting? I think um, just what a, what a Council Brewer said is requesting what the exact amounts are. So um, we could go to the budget and look at them, I think, but I think what, what Council Brewer is saying is have it presented to us um, and that it should be fairly easy for Sean to present that to us. Yeah, that's, yeah. Even with my skill too, I can do that. Okay, <laughs> great. All right. Um, well, it's 748. And so I think we're going to have to keep moving. Um, and so we have Dr. Shabazz is going to report on the Community Preservation Act. And we have Irv, who is going to report on the ARPA funds. So um, Dr. Shabazz, did you want to um, start with the, commu the the Community Preservation Act report? If, if you all would like, sure. Great. Jennifer, may I ask you to uh, bring up the, the two pages from the packet? Um, let me first of all say, uh, I had very good conversations with uh, Anna Devlin uh, Gautier, as well as um, our comptroller, Sonia Aldrich. Um, the uh, CPA uh, funding uh, provides, I think, a, both a, a very uh, promising model to, to look at for, uh, with respect to the way we are imagining a kind of sustainable fund uh, in terms of how, how that fund is managed, how it is regulated, how um, uh, projects come to the uh, Community uh, Preservation Coalition and, uh, and is then uh, doled out. But then also specifically in terms of during this period, while we are, uh, while we exist as an assembly, that uh, ideas that could come forward to us <laughs> that, that or that we would propose um, can, uh, one moment, please. And so it's, um, pardon me. So the, um, possibilities then is that it can also be, um, a possible source of funding for something more immediately that um, we might wish to recommend or back this year or, or, or in future years, even before a, a sustainable fund is generating uh, enough resources to do some things. So if we look at the uh, eligibility flow chart, we see how it is that um, uh, expenditures can come in for items uh, potentially related to affordable housing, to uh, use for land, uh, for recreational use, um, uh, to actually acquire, create, or preserve uh, open space to, a, um, and in the case of uh, acquired open space to um, be able to maintain it. Um, if the asset is owned by a nonprofit, private entity or individual, um, and if we'll scroll on down now to the areas that uh, the CPA actually funds or, or in the other direction, scroll up. Um, this 
box shows a matrix of the allowable projects that the uh, that that the Community Preservation Act can can fund. It can fund areas in terms of open space. It can fund um, for the uh, preservation of historic resources, um, recreational land, and if you scroll it a little bit for community housing. So those are the four areas of allowable spending and uh, scrolling back the other way, you see that it can go in the areas of acquisition, creation, preservation, support, rehabilitation and, ex and restoration, as well as appropriations to affordable housing trust. Um, projects that have been funded uh, or uh, and been proposed for funding through this include many things concerning the, uh, uh, our oldest cemetery in town, West Cemetery, has been the beneficiary of funds to uh, preserve monuments, to uh, uh, create uh, um, uh, structures out there, um, has benefited from this. Also recently, the renovation of Kendrick Park. If you've walked by it or driven by it, you'll see a huge sign that identifies it as uh, a beneficiary of community preservation funding. So there are multiple projects uh, that, that have been funded uh, through these resources. Um, there is a funding cycle, but then there is also um, a, a, a pot of money that can even be applied toward that is outside of that, that regular cycle. But one of the things that uh, Anna uh, Devlin uh, uh, Gautier emphasized is, you know, that as we would prepare a recommendation or as we would prepare to uh, support a project, that the project would really want to be very clear in its narrative, similar to what Yvonne was saying in terms of um, the Mass Council grants, to be very clear, very focused, and to really identify from this rubric exactly, you know, its appropriateness from from this uh, uh, from this very rubric. So um, I I think again in both in terms of projects related to to uh, 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 historical uh, uh, preservation, the interpretation, the the education. That, that all of is meant by historic resources uh, or recreational land uh, um, that, that or community housing, that these are areas that we could certainly um, push reparative justice. Our, our reparative justice plan could certainly uh, recommend uh, these projects for, um, for CPA funding and by that endorsement, perhaps give it an additional an additional uh, boost, uh, and then, but then, secondly, that as a model, this is where, as you have this fund, and especially with state legislation, if we had a fund that was matched by state funding, then you could really begin to see the possibilities for um, uh, uh, funding uh, some some really major and dynamic kinds of actions to address the harms. Um, and, and so I, I, that I submit that as my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. So, um, Dr. Jemison, did you have anything to, um, add with respect to this or comment no, on? Not right now. I mean, it seems like a, it, it, there certainly seems like a source of funds for a specific project. Um, it, I, I did not hear mention of a specific project uh, at this moment, but I, it's good to know that this is out there, so. Great. Okay, so Irv, that leaves us with you reporting on ARPA funds. So ARPA, um, again, the preface uh, my preface to this is that all funds are in play uh, for this year's budget and upcoming budgets. They are in play. Um, the uh, and, and uh, Michelle, do you have that um, particular um, link in relationship to the ARPA funds that you could put up? 
Yeah, I think we added it to the packet. The the image right. shows. Yep, I think that that is that is in our packet. I'm if sorry. we could if we could bring it up because it would help in explaining some things. But anyway, while you're bringing it up, there are a total of twelve million dollars worth of ARPA funds um, that are, are that are available. Now those funds have been split up by the town uh, into two parts, uh, six million dollars uh, for expenditures for fiscal 2022, which we're in right now. And the, the remaining of those, uh, depending upon what happens um, this year, uh, for the following year. Uh, now, there is a, the town has up until, I can't remember, 2024 or 2025, whatever, to expend those funds, All right? Um, what uh, the, the other thing is that um, these ARPA funds uh, have, uh, there are proposed specific proposals that are out there. And that's why I want that, if I could get that slide, it would be uh, really helpful in terms of uh, the ex upcoming proposals to expend those funds by the town. And what I wanted to focus in on, ah, there we go. And if we could move down, um, yeah. there you go. Yeah, you know, if we could scroll down uh, a, a little to uh, the uh, recreation portion of this. Now, you, well, if you look right here where it says public health and racial equity, 19%. Anyway, overreaching or the overall um, goal of this is to be able to expend money in relationship to racial equity. Just, just remember that. That, that. That's a really important point to remember. So if we can go down some more. So I actually, this was just a screenshot. I don't have, I can pull uh, up. You're looking for um, the well, yeah. that, That's right, that, that's right. But you know, anyway. This I can is, pull it up pretty quickly, um, but, but go ahead, keep going. Well, this, this is just uh, an example of the detail that has uh, that the town has gone in through, gone into to explain how these funds are being proposed to be uh, spent. The takeaway for us is that um, tomorrow night uh, there are there is a forum on this, and I have. Uh, and I will and will now recommend that uh, both uh, the co-chairs attend that to make a pitch for funds uh, to um, the AHRA uh, for expenditures for uh, purposes that we will uh, put forward. In other words, I, I know we don't have a specific earmark right now. However, one specific earmark that all of us, well, not all of us, but a lot of people in town, including the community safety working group uh, and other people have spoken about is the youth empowerment center or a community center. Um, these uh, funds can be expended upon there. And in fact, uh, one uh, particular proposal is to put out an RFP for a center, a community center. Um, I would like to be able to present a counter proposal uh, for the expenditures of those funds for a community center. However, in order to do that, um, what is needed is a concerted effort to do an outreach to the community safety working group. Now I'm saying that uh, knowing that the community safety working group is going to go out of business next week, I guess, or something like that. Uh, and so, but there is going to be two of those members who are going to continue on to the next group that's going to be a successor group. That successor group uh, has one of its uh, objectives is the continuation of some of, some of the uh, priorities of the community safety working group. One of those is the community the community center uh, and a youth empowerment center. We somehow need to sit down with that group uh, because those, whoever those members are who are going to continue on 
uh, will not be subject to community uh, to um, um, open meeting laws because they haven't been appointed to another committee at the time they're in between. Uh, and and I, I guess I want to make a plea that all the groups who are interested in a community center or a youth empowerment center, if this is going to become a reality, we all need to sit down and come up with a specific proposal to encumber those funds now rather than later. If we don't do it now, we're going to be put off until fiscal year 2024. And we don't need to be put off until that time. At this particular point in time, there are numbers of different, support, of different parts of money that can be tapped into uh, to fund this center. And remember, a center is not only the physical body, uh, physical building, which has which has to be oh dear, I think we may have lost connection there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> He's frozen for sure. Um, There's also the program. There, there we go. go. Herb, I, we, you froze just for a moment there. Um, I'm always frozen. You just don't see it. Okay. <laughs> um, can I just sort of clarify something um, based on what you, what you just said? So uh, is that, are were you, is that okay for me to jump in and clarify something quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can ask for clarification, then I can clarify. Okay. So, well, one is the point about tomorrow being the sort of final day to give input. Um, not and the that, final day. It's not the final day. My understanding is that the two sessions, the two listening sessions, at least the live sessions are the last day is tomorrow. Um, there is one at four o'clock and one at seven. If there are other days, I didn't see them listed. So no, 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 no. Make, make sure you understand. There are, yeah. there is, there's a formal, formal listening sessions where, where, in which you can make a proposals. Right. All right. And then there's the continuous process by which you can make proposals, which are provided on the website right. and the link that I provided that anyone can make those proposals. In fact, they would prefer, prefer that we, uh, anyone go to that link and make specific proposals. And obviously they're like every, anyone else. They don't want to be surprised and blindsided by some group coming in uh, later on and making demands. It's, they would rather know what they have before them. So I'm, what I'm saying is, yes, you and Dr. Jimson can go uh, before that forum tomorrow, but you can also, and we can also make those proposals via uh, that, um, that link. Right. And so what I am hearing you say and just wanting to clarify is that there are there is the possibility of the African Heritage Reparations Assembly making a pitch. So Dr. Jemison and I, on behalf of the AHRA, making a pitch either through or one or both through the Engage Amherst or at one of the, um, the, the forums, the listening sessions. And what I hear you saying is that there is a call you are calling out to say, we can support this other project that has already been recommended and we can use our voice and our platform to put forward support for that. And so I think looking at both of those, um, we need to talk about if we want to do one or both of those things as a body. We need to come to some sort of agreement about approaching both. Correct. And, and just to be clear, the, the project we're talking about is the uh, Youth Empowerment Center and or the Community Center. Right. And um, I had a chance very briefly, I had to talk, I called Sean to ask him about something I'm going to present on later. And he, um, he basically uh, said that um, there was a piece that he said that I thought was really, oh, he said that 
ARPA funds, if the African Heritage Reparations Assembly were to receive ARPA funds, they could go into our, they would go into our stabilization fund. So we would be essentially asking for funds that we don't have to determine what they're being used for yet to go into our stabilization fund. Um, and that is one thing. And then working with the community safety working group or its successor group or leaders to support the plan of moving forward with the Youth Empowerment Center is another, they're parallel. Qu a question, uh, did Sean indicate uh, whether those particular funds that could go from ARPA into the stabilization fund, would they have to be, uh, you know, uh, characterized in any particular manner? No, that's what I found to be very interesting is that they did not need to be characterized at this time. I, you know, he didn't, he didn't say you're going to get them, <laughs> but what he said is you can make you can you can put the feedback in at, and ask for the funds to be put in the stabilization fund. We don't have to say for what use. Um, we can also ask for funds to support other projects, whether it be the Youth Empowerment or the BIPOC Cultural Center, for example. So from my perspective, we should be asking for our own funds to be put into the stabilization fund and we should be doing what you said, which is collaborating with the other group to support that measure and that, that project. And what? Dr. Jemison, you, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a very brief question. Are there two different community center proposals? Because I'm hearing Youth Empowerment Center and also Community Center. Okay, got it. Uh, because we want two separate ones or there just happen to be two people are envisioning kind of the same solution. I think Jennifer could speak to this for a second, if you wouldn't mind, Jennifer, as a staff liaison to that committee, that would be great. They were two different recommendations. So the CSWG made recommendations in their first report and the Youth Empowerment Center was one and the BIPOC Community Center was another. So they were two separate, doesn't mean that they can't be combined. Not that we necessarily want them to, but they were two separate recommendations. Thank you. Er. Well, I must admit that I am stunned that um, funds can be um, earmarked for us to go into the stabilization fund. Um, which we should request, uh, and, and we should request regardless uh, in terms of how that request will be structured and what we will say there for whatever needs to be decided. But one thing for sure, uh, when um, uh, you and Dr. Jimison go, um, go before the forum tomorrow, you can say that we're gonna be coming forward with that request. For those funds, and that needs needs to be made clear, uh, because you know um, Sean and other people who are uh, with that fund, they need to know what's coming down and it's coming at them, so they can start to make some decisions and to look forward to um, how to go about distributing the money. So we need to be as transparent as possible in terms of yes, we're going to be asking for X amount of those dollars to be put into. Uh, uh, the stabilization fund. Now, I don't know whether we need to make that decision now on how much, but I do know that we need to do it. And, and I don't think we should wait until the, the meeting next week to decide how much we're gonna be asking for. I agree. And I also am wondering, Irv, if you, so are you saying that there's this mechanism for asking through Engage Amherst and through these listening sessions, and then there's gonna be another, a, on top of that, a formal, um, a formal request that we're gonna to have to make as a body? Yeah, yeah. We, there's no way for us to get the money without making a formal request. Okay. What I am saying is, uh, uh, we, we, we need to make sure that we uh, indicate to um, 
uh, Sean and through that site or through the forum that we are going to make a request for a sum of money to be put in the stabilization fund from ARPA funds. We need to make that very clear. So that they can, you know, in other words, they want to anticipate what's coming at them. So this is one way of giving them some clarity in terms of what we are going to be asking for. Uh, and that we are going to be asking for some funds and that those, the amount of funds we're going to be asking for, uh, we will have to them as soon as possible, which, which would be uh, at the end of our next meeting next week. Okay. So is there any objection to some form of Dr. Jemison and I, because we don't know what our schedules are for tomorrow, um, attending a listening session and speaking on behalf of this group um, only right now with respect to funds just for African heritage. We're going to get to the other piece in a second, but for right now, is there any objection to us doing that? If it's good, just a thumbs up would be great. Thank you. Okay. So now moving to the other piece that Irv was addressing, which is whether we want Irv to make the connection with the um, folks that are either in the leadership positions right now, or, you know, I don't know how we want to handle that, but making some connection with the community safety working group to support their request and really bolstering that and, um, and Sean did indicate that that was something that would really be helpful uh, in terms of, you know, uh, voicing um, support for that. So I'd, I'd recommend one of the co-chairs or the co-chairs would, would make that in, uh, entreaty to the community safety working group. <coughs> okay, Jennifer, what do you know about what's happening with the community safety working group? When are they, you know, Tr transitioning, when might the new group be up and running? What do, what do we know? You are muted somehow, though you don't look muted. No, wait, there we <laughs> go. Um, the CSWG is will dissolve on November 1st. Um, so they are coming up with their final report to go before the council, I believe this at this Monday's meeting. Um, and the successor group, we are currently accepting applications or the community, the citizen no, community activity forms for the CSSJC, the Community Social Service Justice Committee. So they, what that, group is going to do is pick up where the CSWG left off and ensure that the rest of the recommendations start to move forward and um, just work in regards to equity across the board for town as well. Great. Irv? Um, one of the things is that, um, and, and I'm trying to um, encourage people to embrace is that um, we are in the budget season. And budgets in the town, like a lot of other things, uh, you have competing interests. And if we wish to have our interests taken into account, we need to have specific proposals. I understand that you know the community safety working group is going out of business. I know that there's going to be a successor group. But I also know that two of those members of the community safety working group are going to move on to this successor group. I mean, I, I think, is that correct, um, Jennifer, that two of them will, all right? Those two people, as of November 1, become free agents until such time as the other committee is formed. Those two members can be um, available to talk with. And, and I guess the final thing is, in terms of me and where I'm at with this particular thing is, I really want that center to happen. And I look out over the landscape of the budget as it's being formed, and I know what's coming down in terms of uh, budget allocations 
uh, and, and, and also the fight for funds. Uh, that if we do not move as a group to get this center, and now we have two possible groups who can work in concert with each other to get this done. And all I am recommending is that one of us, I don't care who it is, I would like to do it because, because of, I have an overview uh, of all of the financial mechanisms that happen here to be able to sit down and talk with that group. But if, if someone doesn't want me to do it, then someone else should be uh, recommended to do it who has similar expertise and experience. I am, I know on my part, Irv, I would be very comfortable with you doing it just because when I'm thinking about going into this, not only do I not have the financials, I don't have the background on the, on the center. So it sounds like you know a lot more about this particular project, so. Um, yeah, and I, I would fully support um, you doing that as well, Irv. Um, I am a little concerned about how I think what you, I hear you saying is that it would be best to wait until after November 1st, um, but I guess I'm not clear on why um, that needs, like, why couldn't an outreach happen even sooner um, if there's maybe just something I missed with respect to that? We, we, you know, we could, I could do that now. There's no reason to wait. Okay. Okay. So um, given, I think maybe it was an open meeting law, um, you know, thought. Um, so given that we, two of us can't go, I don't think, nope. um, to the community safety working group, um, Dr. Shabazz, just trying to understand what, what what the offer is. The offer is to um, present to the existing group or their successor group if uh, uh, the offer of kind of combining our voices as town committees in support of the the youth center, multicultural center. Is that the idea here? It's definitely. It's definitely. Uh, part of that, but the other part is, uh, I don't want to be um, saying something just to be saying something. I want to be saying something to get something done. So when the the approach is that when we when I sit down with them is, hey, you have this objective of having this center. We have a, an objective of supporting that. We have the ability to um, um, go after funds you have the ability to go after funds. Why don't we combine those two abilities so that we have double the ability to go after double the funds? Uh, and, and also piggybacking on what you said, um, uh, Dr. Shabazz, is that we can also say that we are combining our voices as one, that this is something that the community really wants. Well, I, I, I don't wanna speak for anyone in that, in that particular group, but um, I, I would suspect that right now their priority, given that they face this sunset, this sunset uh, on November 1, I think their priority right now is to get their final project report, whatever, completed and prepared to, to turn in, to go into the sunset moment and to, to necessarily think before November 1, they're, they're going to have the bandwidth to, to necessarily entertain the question of the, of, of the financing aspect of their recommendation. They don't have the power to do anything but make a recommendation just like us. So it's the question of, you know, of um, yes, I'm sure there would be a welcome for support, but I just think the, the moment right now is probably sunsetting on the particular group that it, as it exists now, and then whatever the successor group, then certainly I think they would, they, that would be maybe a, uh, a welcome, that, uh, a gesture that they would receive well. Yeah, and I think that we can go ahead and 
we can support them without even meeting with them. There's, that's not, it's not a necessary step. We can say if this body agrees that we support that the money being used for such purposes. Um, and then I think, because we're on that timeline of this needs to actually happen right now, you know what I mean? And so um, Irv then could come in at a, once that successor group is up and running and maybe it gets further defined and figured out. But at this moment, I think if we state, if we voice our support of that project happening, because that's what this body agrees to and supports, I think that that is enough even right now. Um, and, and I agree that they're probably their headspace is somewhere else. And this is a big bucket of money um, to take, you know, that we don't want to miss out on for ourselves or for that, for that, those purposes. So um, I think Irvin and Dr. Uh, just, just remember that um, the, the documents that we can't bring up already has in it an RFV, uh, RFVP for a uh, uh, a community center, all right, and 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 that is specifically aimed at this particular um, request or desire in the community to have it. And all I am wanting to do is to impact that in a way that it will reflect the desires of not only our committee but also the community safety working group and its successor. I guess what I'm saying is I am uncomfortable with and do not wish to have in that, this current uh, round of ARPA proposals, a RFP for a community center that is, uh, I guess, um, in one way to address um, the uh, request by various groups for a community center. I don't want that to be left in there and representing that. And that's why I'm calling for a call for action. Um, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I hope I'm being clear. Dr. Jemison, do you have something that might, <laughs> anything? I'm, I'm gonna attempt to sum up <laughs> what I think are three things and folks can correct me if I'm wrong. So right. the first thing we just agreed to, which was Michelle or I uh, need to go to an ARPA listening session and uh, indicate that the AHRA would like to have some of the ARPA funds earmarked for us. It's the first thing I've heard. Right. What I, what uh, Irv, to me, what you're saying sounds like two things. One is a similar indication of support by the ARHA, AHRA, sorry, <laughs> for the uh, community safety working group's proposal. And the other is when the time is right after they disband a possibility of you or another member from AHRA talking to them further about, you know, the further ways we can present a united front on both their project for community center and our wish for some ARPA funds. Is that anywhere close to what's going on? Very, very, very close. And, and in fact, you know, almost right on. The, the only part is that we, we ourselves, AHRA, would be requesting funds. And, and again, it's a signaling process for a community center. We would be doing that um, in conjunction with um, the, the successor group of community safety working group. All I'm trying to say is I want to I want to make sure again that we signal that this is coming to uh, the uh, ARP uh, in terms of ARPA funds, so that they have some idea. In other, in other words, I do not wish for any member who of the of people who are responsible for disbursements of the ARPA funds to think that they're being ambushed. All right, I want us to be very clear and upfront that we're gonna come after those funds. We don't know the amount of them, but we're gonna be coming after those funds, not only in terms of on our behalf, but on behalf of a community center, those two specific things. Heard, yes. Dr. Shabazz. 
Thank you. So I, I think I may need the clarification that would come with this in a form of a motion um, because I'm, I'm uh, 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 here's where I feel unclear. So if um, members of this body will be going to ARPA to say, bring some of these funds to the reparations, reparative justice stabilization fund. Are we saying not as a project, but just deposit it to, the, to that sustainable fund to be used, to be doled out at some future point, but not as a project. Is that even possible? Do we have information to know that they can divert some or all of that $6 million into our town stabilization fund, the fund that has been created uh, for AHRA. I'm, I, I'm not sure I heard that clearly. Yeah, it was, it, it, uh, I, I clarified and also uh, Michelle clarified it. Yeah, when I talked to Sean today, he said we could make a request for the funds to go into our stabilization fund. Thank you. And then secondly, we're saying out of that same 6 million, we would be supporting the effort of a community center or would it come from out of the process that we create for this body to approve a project? If, the, if some or all of the 6 million were put in our stabilization fund, would that just be coming out of that fund or are we saying separately we're requesting out of this 6 million or the next 6 million support for the community center. I'm not clear. All right. I, I, I think, you know- uh, Irv, Irv, I'm so sorry. Before you go on, I just wanna acknowledge that Yvonne has had her hand up for quite a uh, while. And, um, and I know we're in this kind of awkward position, but I do want to give Yvonne the opportunity to um, speak. Um, I just have a point of clarification about a community center because uh, the focus of our work are people of color of African heritage. And so a community center doesn't speak to that necessarily unless we make it that way. And so I, I think some of what we're pushing for there might be, you know, if we're combining or you know, getting together with another committee, um, our focus is not going to be the same if it's just a general community center. And maybe I'm not speaking with as much information and Jen might, <laughs> might already know, but I think if we're gonna do programs, our programs are, you know, African heritage and not just general youth empowerment. So there has to be some kind of cultural legacy addition part to that, not just a uh, general community center, correct? Yeah, but just make sure that there, there are two things in here. When people talk about a community center, there's the physical asset, the building, location, et cetera. All right, that's one. And then the, the second part of that is, your, your, uh, is um, the programming that goes on within that building. Those are two separate things. And obviously, and then there's a third thing is obviously upkeep and maintenance on on an ongoing basis. So that's why I mentioned programming. I think right, that right. if we, you know having a dedicated building just for African heritage is a cool thing. Right. So so anyway, um, yeah. So yeah, correct. So anyway, to uh, Amilcar's point, um, we make sure that it's clear that we're, we will be requesting a pot of money from ARPA just for AHRA. Make sure that's clear, all right? The second is that there has been a, a lot of uh, talk and uh, the community safety working group wants and desires a uh, community center, either a youth empowerment center or a community center. We, the AHRA, as I envision it, would say, we support that. And we, as a separate request for opera funds, will ask for some monies to be set aside for that purpose. So there are two set asides we're asking for, one specifically for us and one for the community center. 
Now, the only way that I could see us asking for that money uh, as the African American Heritage Reparation Assembly is that we were doing it in concert with and support and in support of the community safety working groups desire for a uh, a community center. And the reason why that is important, once again, is that right now it's already in the ARPA fund proposals for an RFP. And I don't think that's appropriate. Okay, I guess I just want to stop us for a second to say, I think that that the that piece we need to kind of set as a separate piece. Um, I think we're getting tangled up right now and it's late. So my suggestion is that what we move forward with the thumbs up on Dr. Jemison and I, or both of us going tomorrow and speaking on behalf of this group and asking for money to be set aside for this group. And then, um, Perhaps Jennifer will be able to get additional information between now and then from the community safety working group and what they are doing. Um, and, and then we can put this back on the docket for next week. Um, and Dr. Jemison, jump in if, if you have a different idea or something. Uh, nope, nope, you're good. Um, and I thank Irv for clarifying because now this sounds like four separate things, which I'll run through in a minute. But Jen, I feel like I saw you almost wanting to say something. I no? was just I was just gonna clarify that the community safety working group recommended two things, not one or it's the youth empowerment center and the BIPOC community community center. And at the BIPOC community center, it is for programming to benefit the BIPOC community. Um, but it would also be inclusive because you have to have it be inclusive at the same time. So the fact that people can come and, and um, become educated on how on equity issues and how to be more inclusive or, or whatever offerings that come out of program come out of there. So that was all. And is it Jennifer? Just to clarify, is it the Bi is it a BIPOC community center or BIPOC cultural center? Do you remember? I mean, we could just look at the report while okay. you guys are talking, I, I and I'll have the final answer. But I do suggest anybody who has questions about it look on the report on the community safety working groups um, committee. They've got a fantastic report there. Absolutely. And I think it was, I think it's a youth empowerment center and a BIPOC cultural center, but we should definitely verify because Jennifer's correct. Those are two separate projects. They're not, you know, and, and, and also what Irv is saying is speaking specifically to the youth empowerment RFP or the youth center RFP that is in the current proposal. Um, okay. It is a BIPOC cultural center. Okay. Um, so Irv, did you want to say something else with respect to this before we move on? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think we need to move on, but um, just to, in summary, we need to ask for these funds. And by the way, um, Michelle and Dr. Jemison, both of you or one of you can go and make those statements uh, at the forum tomorrow, but you also, can in conjunction with that, um, go on the engage Amherst under that particular section and make the same proposal. Great. Okay, Dr. Jemison, did you say that you wanted to sort of sum everything up or um, um, and also Dr. Shabazz, are you feeling comfortable now with the, okay. Um, so, so as I understand it, uh, the, the thing we already thumbs up, Michelle and I will go tomorrow in some way, engage zone, uh, do the public hearings, talk about ARPA funds for AHRA. We can also communicate our support to uh, the CSWG. We could do that at the public meeting tomorrow if we wanted to, if one of us wanted to go, but we can get that across to them. There is a question on the table of whether or not the AHRA will also request funds for ARPA for a community center but it sounds like that is best planned with the CSWG. So that would be something that happens later, hence postponing the discussion till next week. So it's the four things that I got out of that. 
all right. <laughs> Look, we got it covered. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. So we can move on, I think. Um, so we have covered all of the funding and financial updates that we had set out for tonight. Um, and at this point, we're going to move into the legal update, which is D. Um, and I just will preface by saying that as Dr. Jemison and I have been, you know, we, we met with uh, Rep Dom and I've been, we've both sort of been thinking about this and um, it's been an evolving process. So um, assuming I'm going to talk for a little bit, so I'm, I'm trying to get it as clear as possible, but um, assuming that the setup for us right now is to, in the front half of our work, focus on, focus on setting up a structure for a robust legal reparations program. So that includes funding sources and making sure that we have a legal uh, reparations program. And then the second half of our work is to decide on the types of reparations, the eligibility, all of those other pieces, which will, of course, require the Black Census to be in place, as well as a lot of community input. So if that were the way that we were flowing, um, then I want to draw attention to the third recommendation of the KP Law Report. The third recommendation of that legal memo is to seek special legislation to define reparations as a public purpose and set forth some basic rules as to how such funds will be held, expended, and accounted for. A very quick overview of the types of legislation that are possible in Massachusetts. Special home rule legislation is specific to Amherst. It must go through the TC, the town council before it goes, sorry, those are my notes, must go through the town council before it goes through the state. Um, it's best to be as specific as possible. So we would likely ask KP Law to draft up that special legislation. Um, and as I said, it would only be specific to Amherst. It would allow for our stabilization fund to be legal and for money to come in and go out of it in the ways that were, that were expressly written into that law. The other form of legislation is just regular state legislation introducing new bills um, uh, that would not have to go through the town council, um, could go directly from us to Rep Dom and then through the process Whatever outcomes of that would impact the entire state. Um, and there are very specific timelines associated with passing a bill through. And again, KP Law could help us draft that. So getting more specific, um, we could um, take a multi-pronged approach here. So we could seek special legislation to maintain the stabilization fund and have it be legal, um, which would allow us to add to from various sources. And at the same time, we could seek new legislation to one, create a CPA-like model, which Dr. Shabazz has brought um, to the forefront for us um, since we started meeting. And, and or add eligibility to the current CPA. So Dr. Shabazz showed us four ways that the CPA can be used right now. We could seek new legislation that would allow us to add a fifth use, um, or we could, of course, we could do both. <laughs> um, there's slight differences. If we were to introduce new legislation, there would be a tax surcharge that communities would have to um, deal with if they were to opt into it. Many communities have already opted into CPA. So uh, Sean tells me, for example, that perhaps the surcharge could increase potentially um, to include that additional um, eligibility under the current CPA. But if it were to be new legislation, a whole new CPA model, 
um, then any state, any municipality could opt into that, um, but it would be sort of a, a, a different process. Um, so we need to really find out from Rep Dom, who by the way, was very supportive of this. Um, we need to find out from her which of those, once we've had a chance to discuss it, which of those is easier or if we want to go both. Um, and if we want to take a two to three prong approach, as I've outlined, what I see as being the biggest benefit to this is that we could be the, be the first real program to offer a multi-tiered reparations program. So we could have cash payments for direct descendants um, via the stabilization fund that would have its special legislation attached to it. And then we could also have anything in between that and symbolic reparations that would impact all uh, folks um, through the CPA model. So I am a strong advocate of a multi-tiered approach. I think that the conversation of reparations has often come back to um, who is eligible and why. And I think that there are good reasons why direct descendants of enslaved people should have one form of reparations. That's my personal opinion that I'm adding in here, but I think that there's a multi-tiered approach that can be had. And this, this setup, if we go the two or three pronged approach, um, would allow us to take all of that into consideration and be the most flexible and least limited. And it is 8.42. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to stop. Um, and I see Dr. Shabazz has his hand up. We may want to push this off to the, to the next meeting to really dive into it, but I've sort of laid it out there and we could certainly, if everybody's in agreement, put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Is that what you were gonna say, uh, Dr. Jemison? Okay. <laughs> Does everybody agree to doing that, to making this a, a focus for our next meeting? Yes, I do. Okay, and I we can find out from um, from Rep Dom the answer to the question about what would be easier, more cumbersome in terms of getting it through. Um, and Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, this doesn't go into the, the, the details of the multi-tiered model, your, your legal model you're discussing, but uh, I did have a question relative to you repeatedly kept referencing KP law. We can get KP law. Uh, I thought at one point we talked about there being other legal expertise out there that we might uh, want to look at both in the state as well as outside of the state of Massachusetts than KP law, because I do have serious questions about how well KP law could do all these, could do some of these things. Yes, thank you for, um, for, for recognizing and acknowledging that. And I think that that's something that we would have to discuss further, um, whether it, you know, whether we would use sort of the town um, attorney to do the work in maybe collaboration with other um, people who are already doing this work and have the experience of doing this work. Okay. Um, Dr. Jemison, do you want to take it from here? Thank you I'm for- I'm tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> Thank you for being our, our meeting Sherpa. Um, <laughs> so, um, Presentations item looks is a little bit so, for, and also thank you everyone for, for bearing up under a very long program today. I think we had some very thoughtful discussions, and I feel like a lot was clarified. Um, just looking forward to digging in even even better next week. Um, uh, are there any presentations or anything uh, that has come up that folks have got to add in here? No. All right. Um, we have a BAM update also on here. Is that? Uh, I'll just add, I'm sorry, these yeah. are standing items that we added in just to, if we have someone coming to present, like we had coffee last time, we would have a spot for that. Um, and then the BAM update is a standing update, which it seems like we sort of already got. So we can, it's just so that we have a placeholder for those, those items. Um, so I think we could probably move right to any additional public comment. 
Excellent. All right. So welcome to our second public comment period. Uh, during the public comment period, one of the co-chairs will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by saying your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the co-chairs based upon the number of people who wish to speak. And the speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The AHRA will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. So. All right, we recognize uh, Evan Naismith. Hey, same address, same pronouns. Um, so the reason the town lawyers indicated direct payments were impermissible was because the proposal given to them was race explicit on paper. If we keep reparations race neutral on paper, direct payments are 100% legal. This is exactly what Republicans do with gerrymandering and voting rights. They make racist laws that are race neutral on paper and they get upheld. But progressives should use the same format, make anti-racist laws that are race neutral on paper. We should not cede this strategy to the Republicans. We should instead make legally resilient good trouble. Municipalities write grants all the time, but they are need or merit based. By remaining race neutral, Amherst could absolutely make payments to black majority members of the community, technically using race only as a secondary factor. For example, affirmative action at Michigan Law School was upheld in 2003 because it was race neutral on paper, though not in practice. So too with the Fisher lawsuit challenging Texas's top 10 plan. That law too was technically race neutral, but was designed entirely to benefit the black and Latino communities of Texas. Therefore, it was upheld by the Supreme Court. Black majority direct payments answers many questions you asked tonight. It turbocharges fundraising. It's more reparations-y than any of the alternatives, and it would almost certainly be the favored benefit method of Black community. When Evanston's reparations law gets overturned by the U.S. District Court of Chicago, why shouldn't Amherst be the lighthouse in the storm? Dr. Shabazz, I know you want direct payments. This is the only opportunity to institute direct payments without stepping on the Equal Protection Clause. If the town lawyers shoot my proposal down, I'll stop commenting, but I will keep buying plenty of cannabis to fund the good fight. However, if they affirm what I've researched, black majority direct payments in Amherst would be the most legally resilient model in America. I know the meeting format does not allow you to comment on my assertions, but please reach out to me. Both Dr. Shabazz and Ms. Miller have my contact info and Dr. Rhodes will have it tomorrow via postcard. I appreciate all of your commitment to narrowing the black white wealth gap here in Amherst, but I can't be the only one who favors direct payments. Call me. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Not seeing any other hands raised. I think we can go on to upcoming agenda items and meeting schedules. Um, we're scheduled for next week, uh, Wednesday, October 27th at 6.15 p.m. Um, and uh, I have captured a few agenda items, um, mainly the report um, discussing if the AHRA will request additional ARPA funds on behalf of the um, of a community center. So further discussion about that. Um, also discussion uh, to follow on what we've learned about uh, the money available to us from cannabis taxes. Um, Michelle, I don't know if you've captured anything else or if folks have items that have come up. I think a continuation of the legal uh, discussion, yeah. um, a report back on the Mass Cultural Council um, and a report back on um, Oh, there was another report back. <laughs> My brain is getting <laughs> tired. Um, there was another report back on, on one of the-, the Preservation Act? Yeah. Yes. The okay. Preservation Act, yeah. 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 Okay, huh. thank what you. you? Perfect. Um, and Jennifer, yeah, you had your hand. Um, so I believe, Dr. Shabazz was going to report back on website and Irv was going to report back on 
the Donahue Institute or the census? Yeah. Yeah, that's there. Perfect. That does seem to round it out, but if anything else <laughs> comes up, please email Dr. Jemison and I. Absolutely. Um, any topics not reasonably anticipated by the co-chairs in 48 hours of advance of the meeting we want to bring up? Nope. nope. All right, move to adjourn. Just need a time. <laughs> it is 8.51, <laughs> adjourned at 8.51. Thank you, everyone. Hang in there. Get a good night's sleep. Good night, all. Bye. Good night. Thank you.